Hey everyone, please support what I do to help keep Greyhawk alive by subscribing to the channel. Also, please consider becoming a channel member to get early access to videos, exclusive live chats, quarterly adventure modules, and more. Thanks, and enjoy the show. So I was thinking about where Greyhawk goes after the, the last published stuff, and I wanted to talk about Greyhawk's future today on Greyhawk Grognar. So a while ago, I did a video comparing the fall of Rome to the twin cataclysms, the, the Reign of Colorless Fire and the Invoked Devastation that destroyed the Sul Imperium and the Bakalunish Empire. Um, <clears throat> and I, I made a comparison of the timelines, you know, so if you take about, a th those twin cataclysms in Greyhawk happened about a thousand years before the published era, right? The published era starts in 576, that's when the Guide to the World of Greyhawk is published, and it ends around 601, that's the last time we see any published material from uh, Wizards of the Coast regarding Greyhawk. So we have that nice, you know, 25 year interval. And when you look at where we stand at the end of that interval, uh, we've had the wars, um, we've had the kind of reversal of the wars, IU still rules in the north, but, you know, uh, and, and the, the Great Kingdom is fractured, uh, but most of the rest of the Flaness is still, you know, is, is kind of back to where it was originally. You know, we're down a couple of nations, but the rest is, is kind of back to, back to normal, and that's thanks to Jim Ward <laughs> a lot. Um, <clears throat> But where that now positions the world of Greyhawk is where I wanted to, what I wanted to talk about today. Because if you compare historically Europe to uh, the Flaness, um, we are about a thousand years after the Cataclysm. So that puts us a thousand years after the fall of Rome, which is about the 15th century. Um, and the 15th century in Europe is noted for being the start of the age of exploration. That's when we see the Portuguese uh, explorations around uh, the coast of Africa, um, and of course the establishment of colonies all along that coast. Um, you know, looking for trade routes. They're looking for new trade routes into uh, India and the Far East. Um, we also see Spanish exploration across the Atlantic. First they go to the Azores, then they go uh, to uh, 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 the Caribbean and South America and North America, you know, so we have these and then the English get involved and more and the Dutch and so forth. So we have this as the, the, the start of that age of exploration. And if you compare the state of the Flaness to the state of Europe at the time of that start of that burst of, of exploration, um, we see that there's a lot of similarities. Um, you know, we have in the Flaness, we have this very closed off insular overland trade for the rest of Oerk. So the all trade has to go basically go through um, the Bakunish lands. Uh, you can't go through the Sea of Dust. Uh, there's huge mountain ranges uh, in the between the Flaness and everything else. So going through the uh, Ket and the Backlunish lands is pretty much the only way that the Flaness has to trade with, uh, you know, farther nations, which is why you don't really see much uh, communication between them. You know, we know from that, uh, that infamous uh, map, which I'll show in a second, um, that, uh, you know, there are a lot of other lands to the west of the Flaness, but they're, they're kind of inaccessible. And I think that is what we're going to see. Um, you know, that poses a great uh, opportunity uh, not only for the Flaness in game, but also for uh, game masters to kind of take your Greyhawk campaign into a different direction if you so choose. And that's what I wanted to, to really go into a little uh, depth about today. So here we have the uh, map of Oerk from Dragon Annual 1. And I know a lot of people don't like it. I don't care. We're using it. It's, it's canon. That's what we got. Don't comment. Um, this is obviously the Flaness up here in the upper right. Um, and we have, you can see, we have all these mountains cutting everything off. We've got the, the where it says Sulim uh, Empire here, that's now the Sea of Dust. We've got the Bakalunish lands, which I mentioned, and you only have this little gap to for all the trade from all of the Flaness to travel overland. And even then, it's, you know, you've, you've still got to get through the Bakalunish lands and then into the Celestial Imperium and then even further afield. So there really isn't a lot of uh, stuff to, to do um, you know, in terms of trade. There's no real trade, natural trade routes from 
uh, the Flaness into uh, central or, or western uh, orc. So I think what we would want to see is a, a an age of exploration uh, with the idea of opening up new trade. And the reason that you know, the, the impetus for this would be in the aftermath of all the wars and everything, the nations of the Flaness are rather impoverished and they're looking for better opportunities to garner wealth. And those are going to be done through trade. So I think we, what we would see is we would see first a, um, uh, an exploration of uh, Hetmona land down here, um, uh, the, the Amadeo jungle and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe a circumnavigation of the entire subcontinent. Um, and this was, uh, you know, detailed a little bit in the product, um, uh, the Scarlet Brotherhood, uh, where they talk about the Tuv peoples, which is a new uh, subrace of humans that was introduced there. Um, you know, and, and obviously they're focused on the Scarlet Brotherhood, which is here. But uh, I think we could see one of, the, one of the lands out here, and I'll talk about which one in a second, um, you know, doing a circumnavigation of Hepmona land in the same way that we saw the Portuguese uh, going around Africa. Now we've also got this western route over here um, into what's called the Pearl Sea and the Sea of the Dragon King. Uh, we've got Zindia, which I call Zahindia in my uh, in my stuff. Nippon, which is obviously a Japanese analog and, and so forth. And you could even then round the horn here and go into the Celestial Sea and into the Celestial Imperium. So you've got two main ar uh, avenues of exploration if you want to go into uh, the Western Auric. Um, you know, you've got uh, Hetmonolan and then you've got through the Pearl Sea. Um, we've also got the option of going straight east off of the map into the... Um, uh, into what's called Aquaria, which is Frank Menser's uh, campaign world that was originally supposed to be part of the world of Greyhawk. It, um, and obviously, that never happened officially, but you know it's still unofficial canon for a lot of people. So you know, and, and you could even then go past Aquaria into um, uh, in, into the westernmost coast of Oerk, which was detailed in the Sundered Empire. Uh, which was part of the the 2001 chainmail games, you know. So there's there's lots of opportunities here, and this really gives the game master an opportunity to open up the rest of Oerk, um in in a way that we really haven't seen before because the Flaness has been so um, so insular. Now, one of the things you know, one of the obvious uh, questions that that has to be raised is uh, in a world where magic is real, uh, why hasn't there been much more exploration of the rest of the world? Uh, and, the, and the obvious answer is there has been. You know, there, there, it's not like no one has ever left the Flaness, um, you know, on a flying carpet or, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, on a regular voyage or going through a slide at the bottom of a dungeon and going to the other end of the world, you know, that does happen. But it happens on a, on a rather small scale. Uh, you know, an individual level or a party of adventurers might go into the Celestial Imperium or whatever, um, you know, or a, um, a, a clan of exiled dro might go use the Underdark to go west further, uh, you know. But in terms of a large-scale effort uh, that has a real socioeconomic impact on the Flaness, that's a different story than somebody using a wish spell to go to, um, you know, in, into Zahindia. Or, or something like that, you know. So, so yes, it's it's not the case that nobody's ever done this. Uh, you know, just look at Marco Polo. Uh, you know, it, to use another real world analog. You know, he he made the the journey, um, and then came back and wrote about it. But it wasn't until several centuries later that we saw a real uh, opening of these uh, of these ocean bound trade routes uh, that that really you know broke open the whole idea of of trade in in, in medieval Europe, late medieval Europe. Um, you know, so that so it's you know I'm not saying this never happened. I'm just saying we're talking about a, a much larger scale thing at this point. Uh, now we've got here obviously the map of the Flaness that we're all familiar with, uh, and I wanted to explore who might be inclined to explore where. And one of the things that we have to remember is right here the Lordship of the Isles um, and and the Scarlet Brotherhood. They control the Tilva Strait here, um, and it is this area. Of, of water that is so vital to sea 
trade between the western and eastern halves of the Flaness because you have to, if you're going to go from here to here, you've got to go through this Tilva Strait and it is blocked off completely. Um, and we see this in, in The Adventure Begins where the Lordship of the Isles has made overtures to most of the seafaring nations around the Azure Sea and they want to, you know, establish, you know, their, their ships will take uh, cargo through these dangerous waters and so forth. It's basically a scam. Um, but they do effectively blockade it. So um, I don't think the Lordship of the Isles is uh, going to be interested necessarily in exploration. Um, they're very happy in their role as uh, puppets, uh, although very well camouflaged puppets of the Scarlet Brotherhood, um, and they have no incentive to open up new trade routes. On the other hand, the Sea Barons uh, ac absolutely do, as do um, Onwal and... Um, uh, Kale land and and so forth, uh, and especially Greyhawk because they you know they own basically the Woolly Bay at this point, um, and you know their trade would go through this uh, the Azure Sea through the Denzac Gulf. Um, now the the key is, um, uh, I, I th that the way to get around this is to go around Hetmonaland, and this keys into what we were saying before, where the go circumnavigating Hetmonaland is kind of the equivalent of going around. Um, uh, the Horn of Africa by the Portuguese. So the, the question remains, who would be those explorers to do that? And obviously, as they did it, they'd be, you know, they'd, they'd find agents of the Scarlet Brotherhood. Uh, you could turn this into an epic campaign of just trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, navigate the waters around Hetmonaland uh, and open up that trade from um, uh, from the Denzac Gulf into the Oljat Sea without going through the Tilda Strait and just, you know, in one fell swoop. It's a longer route, but you're also... Uh, kneecapping the um, the Lordship of the Isles and the Scarlet Brotherhood's uh, 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 you know stranglehold on trade through through that strait there. So um, you know you could you could have it be any one or even a, an, agglomer uh, an agglomeration of uh, maybe Greyhawk and Kale and um, you know uh, and Onwal uh, together you know going in and, and trying to do that. Um, as far as the, uh, the the drive eastward to Aquaria, uh, that is the natural thing that you would expect the sea barons to do over here. Um, you know, they're they're always touted as being explorers. They're now, um, you know, with the breakup of the Great Kingdom, they have a little more freedom of action. Uh, you know, so they might be interested in just heading east, seeing what's there, and running into Aquaria. Um, you know, I think that's a very um, a very plausible scenario. As far as going south and into um, the, the Pearl Sea and, and Zahindia and, and Nippon and so forth. Uh, again, it could be um, more explorers from Greyhawk. It could be Onwal or uh, ID or, or, or something. I, uh, I would personally probably want it to be somewhere over to the west. You know, I want to, I want to break it up. Oh. Now, for me, this hits all the right notes. Um, you have th at least three opportunities for enormously epic campaigns. Uh, you know, you've got the East, the Around the Horn, and the South. Uh, it, it, any one of those, you could put uh, adventurers on and have them play for uh, years in game and, par and probably uh, in real time too, uh, taking them from lowly uh, 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 sea dogs to you know being captains of their own ships or whatever at the uh, at the journey's end. I mean, there's all kinds of ways you could do it. Um, it hits the historical note because the timing works out great in the parallel between uh, O Earth and uh, our Earth, um, and especially medieval Europe and, and the Flaness, uh, and it, and it gives a new drive to the campaign uh it gives a new impetus you know to, to what's going on because you know we're kind of you know it, it feels kind of in need of a refresher uh after the events of the wars and then the aftermath of the wars and and you know we're 25 years into the campaign setting at this point um you know uh, same caveat applies that applied in the previous video about advancing the timeline i know people don't like it i like it i you know I, i've grown to like it so that's what i'm doing um so anyway, uh, this is this is my thought on how uh, the next phase of the Greyhawk campaign can work. Uh, you know, opening it up. Uh, this gives you the opportunity to explore those lands beyond the Flaness, which has always been a passion of mine, and I know it's been uh, near and dear to the hearts of a lot of uh, Greyhawk fans for many, many years. Um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to have your characters uh, penetrate deeply into uh, uh, in, into. Uh, 
at Mona Land, and you could explore Aquaria, which has been published in a bunch of different places uh, over the years, and um, you could make your own Zahindia, your own Nippon, your own Celestial Imperium. Uh, my own uh, take on Zahindia, by the way, is available on the blog, uh, link below. <clears throat> I did a whole series of, uh, of articles with maps and the whole bit. Whole bit. You know, if you want to use that in your campaign, that's what it's there for. Um, and I'm going to be keep. I'm going to be keeping going. I'm just been wrapped up with other stuff. Uh, but those those articles are not done, and I'm going to keep going across the Flaness, uh, across uh, Oerk. So uh, stay tuned. That's coming. Uh, so anyway, this is my idea for what happens after the year 600 in the uh, in the Flaness um, and in in uh, Earth as a whole. Uh, what do you think? What do you think of my ideas? Uh, do you like my uh, you know, my parallels between Earth history and, and that of the world of Greyhawk. Uh, do you agree with my assessment of how uh, an age of exploration might uh, might start off in uh, in Greyhawk? Let me know what you think in the comments. I'd uh, love to hear from you and hope you're doing all well. Thanks for watching today's video. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Below you'll find links to my Patreon, which helps make these videos possible. You'll also find the web store where you can buy my books, and my blog where you'll find all sorts of free downloads and other articles. Thanks, and have a great day.